The older I get the more and more I realize that life is not fair. There are those who attempt to lie and say it is but that is a lie. Life is not fair. It's really not. Not everyone receives the same opportunities in life. Not everyone receives the same chances or breaks in life. Life is not fair. You don't choose what part of the world you are born. Some people are born in a third world country where their opportunities are significantly limited in comparison to someone who is born in a first world affluent nation. You don't choose the family or the upbringing you have. Life isn't fair. It took me over 45 years to learn that life is not fair. Not everyone goes through the same hardships and the same struggles as other people. Some people are born with quite literally the world stacked against them life is not fair. While some people are born with silver spoons in their mouth, and they have never ever had to worry about money a day in their life. And I have seen how cruel life can be to people. I have seen how cruel life can be to good people lovely people. You see as a pastor you see people at their lowest and even their highest points. But I have seen how life can pull the rug off under people's feet. I've seen a faithful spouse receive divorce papers from a cheating spouse. I remember seeing a news story last year of a man who was freed after 44 years in prison following a wrongful conviction. Imprisoned wrongfully for 44 years, 44 years, for a crime he did not commit. 44 years. Years passed. Decades passed. And I cannot fathom how that man felt to see life pass him by for 44 years for a crime he did not commit. He went in as a young boy and came out an old man. 44 years. There is nothing fair about that. Life is not fair. Life is ruthless. This world can quite literally be ruthless. I remember listening to a preacher preaching on this same subject, and he said the following paragraph and it stuck with me for years. Some folks have to work harder than other people. Some people don't have the breaks that others have. Life's not fair. It took me a while to learn that. It took me a while to learn that life can dish you out some backstabbing things. Life can stab you in the back when you are innocent, and you haven't done anything. That's the way this world is. And isn't that so true? You see parents who give birth to a child, and a mother and father pours all their heart and soul into that child. Raise that child with every fiber of their being. Pour all of their resources, their love and affection, their time and money into that child. To see that child die at 21. And what do you say to a parent going through that? What can you say to a parent experiencing that pain? There is nothing fair about that. No parent should have to bury their child. That's not fair. But it happens in this world we live in. And that parent has to live with a part of the heart missing. Life is not fair. We live in a broken world because of sin. I am sure if you look at your own life there are things you see which have happened to you which are just clearly not fair but that is the nature of this life. Not just unfair things but even personal tragedies. I am sure you in your personal life you have experienced tragedies and calamities. And the worst thing about tragedies they come in different shapes and sizes. There are some that come and are open and exposed for all of the world to see. And there are others which are quiet and subtle that not even your closest family members know it happened to you. And the sad reality is right now as I am preaching this message there are some people who are living in fear. Living in fear that something bad is going to happen to me. It's been too long with nothing bad happening to me. Things are going to well right now. Something bad has to happen. Now thank God. Thank God. That this unfair world is not going to last forever. This world that is full of tragedy is not going to last forever. How does that make you feel knowing that you as a born-again believer are going to place where there is no unfairness, where the ruler is a just God, who loves you, can cares for you so much so that he was willing to send his only begotten son to die for you? Heaven This is one of the biggest mistakes we make as Christians. We don't think enough about heaven. No, we don't. 
Heaven for a lot of believers is an afterthought. Heaven for some believers is something they are not even looking forward to. My friend, I am telling you heaven will be so amazing. All the unfair things that happen here in this world do not exist in heaven. All the tragedies that exist here on earth don't exist in heaven. I want you to look forward to heaven. Look forward to it. Welcome it. Just imagine a place where there are no worries, no wars, no jealousy, no lust, no sin, no heartbreak, no pain, no aging. You won't grow old. You won't ever get sick. You won't ever lose a loved one. No sickness, no hospital, no doctors, no dentist, or afflictions, or death, or injustices, and loss. What are you worried about right now? What are you stressed about right now? What are you losing sleep over tonight? Whatever it is, it won't exist in heaven. Imagine a life where you will never have to worry. A life where you never get stressed. Your mind can't fathom that type of life, but that is what waits for a believer. A place so beautiful, a place so perfect, a place so peaceful, a place so loving, a place so unique where everything is so perfect and beyond description. A place where we will be singing and worshiping God, beholding His glory. Heaven is that place, my brother and my sister. It is a place of unimagined blessing, a spectacular place. I know I mentioned this before, but I want to mention it one more time. There will be no death. Death has stalked mankind ever since the time of Adam. Death has had a near enough 100% record. But not in heaven. It is not allowed. Never again will you have to go to a graveyard. Never again will you have to see a casket. Never again will a family weep and mourn. Never again will you receive a phone call to tell you that a loved one has passed on. Never again will you hear about a high school friend or teacher who has passed on. Blessed God, I am ready for that day. Every second someone is receiving news of the passing of a loved one. Never again. Never again. You will have no reason to mourn over your loved ones. Everyone will be happy together forever and no more fear of death. The Bible made it clear that there would be no death. That is not all. If there are no deaths anymore, that means the things that cause death will not exist. They will be gone. Sickness won't be able to enter the gates of heaven. Death won't be able to enter the gates of heaven. There will be nothing but life where you are heading. Nothing but joy where you are going. There will be nothing but perfect health. No medication. No checkups in the land of the living. I know I preach a lot about heaven but that is because I want you to look forward to it. And the best thing about heaven is you will be able to see God face to face. Revelation says, Just imagine seeing God face to face. I struggle even imagining what God looks like, but there will come a day where I don't have to imagine what God looks like. One day I will see the Lord. Allow that to bring you peace in whatever you're going through. Know that one day I will be with the Lord and He will wipe all of my tears away. I will be safe in His hands for all eternity. My Father, my Heavenly Father, my Redeemer, my Lord. The Man Who Died with Angels Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31 There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, 
and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can thy pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Two men, two destinations, two men, two eternal everlasting eternities, two men who live two different lives, but they both have something in common. What they had in common was that what they did in this life determined their eternal destiny. The story of Lazarus and the rich man in Hades presents a powerful contrast between their lives on earth and their fates in the afterlife. Both men experienced death, but their earthly circumstances couldn't have been more different. Lazarus, a beggar, suffered a life of destitution and misery, unnoticed and disregarded by society. In fact, he was denied even the basic honor of a burial. This striking contrast serves to highlight an important truth. In this world, you may be deemed worthless, but in the eyes of God, you are worth dying for. The story of Lazarus and the rich man in Hades underscores the profound significance and value that each individual holds in the heaven realm, regardless of their earthly status. God doesn't care about your money. He doesn't care about the area you live in, the size of your house, the car you drive. No, God cares about your relationship with him. Rich or poor, young or old, God cares about your relationship with him. Do you know him and does he know you? Lazarus, as the epitome of insignificance in the eyes of the world, symbolizes the marginalized and forgotten members of society. Throughout his life, he endured the harsh reality of poverty, sickness, and hunger. No one cared about his troubles. He was irrelevant to the world's concerns. When Lazarus eventually passed away, his earthly existence seemed to have been entirely dismissed, as even the basic dignity of a proper burial was denied to him. Think about that. No one bothered to bury him. No one cared. However, the narrative takes a dramatic turn as we discover that heaven honored Lazarus in a profound way. The angels themselves carried him to Abraham's bosom, a place of utmost favor and divine embrace. The world thought Lazarus died alone, no. He died with angels. He died with angels. The tale of Lazarus reminds us that even when the world overlooks and undervalues us, heaven takes notice, you may be overlooked in this world. You may be nothing more than another social security number in this world. However, there is a God in heaven who cares enough for you to die for you. The contrast between Lazarus's earthly insignificance and his heavenly honor emphasizes the true value and worth that lie within each person. Though the world may deem individuals as meaningless or unworthy, the corridors of heaven tell a different story. In the heavenly realm, where God's love and compassion reign supreme, every soul matters. Lazarus's experience of being carried by the angels and finding himself in the presence of Abraham highlights the profound truth that in God's family, every individual holds immeasurable significance. This story challenges the world's judgment of worth based on material wealth, social status, or worldly achievements. However, the God of this Bible is not impressed with your wealth. What matters to God is your relationship with him. In contrast to Lazarus, who was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom, the rich man did not have the same heavenly escort or a pleasant destination awaiting him. Despite his wealth and status in the world, he found himself in Hades, a place of torment and suffering. I can imagine the rich man's funeral, the pomp and pageantry associated with his funeral. Yet he did not die with angels. This stark contrast reminds us that earthly honors and possessions do not guarantee a favorable outcome in the afterlife. 
The story emphasizes that true worth is not measured by material wealth or worldly success. Instead, it highlights the importance of how we live our lives and treat others, as well as our relationship with God. Brothers and sisters, what you do in this life matters. It matters. We grossly underestimate the eternal consequences of this life. What you do on this side of eternity matters. I plead with you today to take this life seriously. This life is not a video game. You literally only get one life. And from that life, you get one eternal destiny. Either heaven or hell. There is no middle ground. Lazarus was a beggar who had nothing but sores on his body and hunger in his stomach. He always stayed at the gate of the rich man who paid him no attention whatsoever. Eventually, both the rich man and Lazarus died, and they went their separate ways. Two people on earth that crossed paths here on earth, but in eternity they went their separate ways. And it may be like that for those of you listening to me right now. You may be a husband and wife listening to me, but one of you is right with the Lord, and they are heading to heaven, and the other one is not right with the Lord, and they are heading to hell. Salvation is an individual journey. Don't count on other people's relationship with God. Count on your own relationship with Jesus Christ. Lazarus was carried into heaven by angels into the bosom of Abraham. But look at what the Bible says about the rich man. He died, and the Bible says what happened next to him. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes. Imagine how the rich man would have felt to open his eyes and see where he was, and in hell he lift up his eyes. I am sure he must have thought to himself, this must be a dream. I am sure the rich man would have tried to shock himself to wake up, but slowly and surely he would realize that I am in this place for all eternity. In the midst of his suffering, he called out to Abraham to help him and begged Abraham to send Lazarus to the earth to warn his family members about hell. But Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The verses preceding Luke chapter 16 verse 19 indicate that Jesus was warning the people against the danger of putting one's trust in riches. He draws a sharp contrast between materialism and godliness. He ridicules wealth for its ephemeral power which lasts only on earth and draws our attention to godliness, whose power transcends the earth. In Luke chapter 16 verses 13 through 14, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. In the sight of God, money makes no difference. It is either you serve God or money, not both. The choice you make determines where you find yourself in the end. Where would you rather be? What is more important to you, the pleasures of now or those of eternity? Allow me to make things clear. It is not a sin to be rich. It is not a sin to have money. The Bible encourages us to work and to earn money. The point is this, money should not be the God of your life. When you start prioritizing your money over God, you have a problem. Nothing saves us and grants us the assurance of eternal rest other than our relationship with God. This is what Lazarus had, but the rich man lacked it. The rich man couldn't buy his way through with his wealth. Imagine what heaven would be like if you could buy your way into heaven. Thank God you don't. Here are a few lessons to learn from the story of Lazarus, the man who died with angels at his service. Have a rich heart towards God. Mark chapter 8 verse 36. What good is for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? What matters to God is not the money we have in our hands or the assets we possess in our name. Is God not the custodian of these things? God desires you to be rich somewhere else. Whether or not you have physical money, He wants you to be rich in your heart towards Him. While human beings focus on the outward, God's focus is on the quality of the heart. Luke chapter 16 verse 15 says, 
And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Therefore, our utmost priority shouldn't be to amass wealth, but to build a strong relationship with God. When we get to heaven, the only thing that will matter before our Maker is the way we lived on earth, not what we had. Your wealth does not imply that you were chosen by God. The fact that you're poor doesn't mean that God hates you or is displeased with you. If you draw close to God, He'll draw you closer irrespective of your financial status. Lazarus must have had a good relationship with God. This was why he was able to enjoy eternal bliss. Being rich or poor doesn't indicate one's spiritual health. In pursuance of wealth, we should never ignore our relationship with God and a godly lifestyle. Our wealth will not buy us a place in heaven, neither would it earn us God's favor. If one acquires the whole world and loses their soul, is there any gain? Rather than focus on having a fat bank account, choose to be rich in the heart towards God. Death is inevitable, and whether or not we want to or not, we all will stand before the throne of God to give account of all we did in our body. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. This is inescapable for everyone. We all have to face it. Knowing that we have a God to whom we are accountable, we must live cautiously and with intentionality. Today, I want to address a prevalent perception that many people hold about life, the notion that it is just one big party that will never end. In a world obsessed with pleasure, wealth, and material possessions, it is crucial for us as believers to recognize and understand the temporary nature of earthly life and possessions. Let us delve into this topic and explore how it impacts our perspective, choices, and ultimately our eternal destiny. It is true that our culture often promotes the idea that life is an uninterrupted series of parties where indulgence and self-gratification reign supreme. We are bombarded with messages that suggest happiness and fulfillment can only be found in material wealth, fame, and fleeting pleasures. However, as followers of Christ, we must remember that this perspective is a deceptive illusion. The Bible reminds us time and again that our earthly existence is temporary. When an individual reads the Bible, they are confronted by this reality. Like a passing shadow or a fading flower, our lives are here today and gone tomorrow. James 4 verse 14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. Psalm 144 verse 4, Man is like a breath, his days are like a passing shadow. Our time on this earth is limited, and therefore, basing our happiness solely on temporal pleasures is both foolish and short-sighted. Take a moment to reflect on how quickly the years have flown by. It seems like just yesterday we were young and carefree, yet now we find ourselves facing the reality of aging and the inevitability of our mortality. This reflection should serve as a wake-up call, reminding us that life is but a fleeting moment and our focus must extend beyond the temporal. Material possessions, no matter how abundant or luxurious, cannot provide lasting satisfaction. Jesus warned against storing up treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. The reality is that all our possessions will one day fade away or be left behind. We enter this world empty-handed, and we will leave it the same way. As Christians, we are called to adopt an eternal perspective, recognizing that our true home is not of this world. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Our focus should be on building treasures in heaven, where they are imperishable and beyond the reach of decay and loss. It actually has its roots in the story of Belshazzar's feast from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. One of the most infamous characters in the Old Testament is King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar's line eventually fell to Belshazzar. 
Belshazzar threw a great feast for a thousand of his lords. Belshazzar threw this great feast whilst there was a siege surrounding the city. The fact that there was an army at his doorstep did not concern him at all. Belshazzar was a proud, proud man, and he was confident in Babylon's defenses and its vast supplies. Now, back to the feast. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. This was an extremely irreverent act by Belshazzar. By taking these vessels he openly mocked God, and he committed the sin of sacrilege something few people are concerned with today. What is sacrilege? It is committing acts that violate, disrespect, or misuse things considered sacred. That is called sacrilegious. The participants of Belshazzar's feast drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. As the thousand lords raised their goblets to celebrate Belshazzar's greatness and their false gods, a hand appeared and wrote some Hebrew letters on the wall. Belshazzar cried aloud to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers to interpret the letters, but they could not. It was Belshazzar's wife who suggested that Daniel be summoned. When Daniel arrived, Belshazzar offered to make him third in rank in the kingdom if he could translate the Hebrew letters. Daniel refused the gifts, stating, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel proceeded to translate. In doing so, he reminded Belshazzar of how God threw his father down until he learned subservience to God. Daniel pointed out that Belshazzar had been drinking from the temple vessels, but had not given honor to God. He then went on to translate the four words that would change the very trajectory of Belshazzar's life. Daniel 5 verse 25 to 30, and this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel Uparsin. This is the interpretation of each word, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they closed clothed Daniel with purple, and put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, that very night, that very night, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. I preach this sermon to you because we can learn a lot from Belshazzar. Hours before his very own death, Belshazzar was seeking pleasure. He was busy enjoying sinfulness. And let's not pretend that there is no pleasure in sin. There is so much, so much pleasure in sin. Sin is very pleasurable, it is. If sin was not pleasurable, people would not be doing it. But the pleasure of sin does not last forever. The pleasure of sin is deceitful. Because the pleasure of sin does not reveal to an individual the wages of sin. Belshazzar was seeking pleasure not knowing that he was hours away from standing before the Lord God Almighty, that he was openly mocking. Belshazzar was feasting and enjoying whilst the enemy was at his gates. There are people who, just like Belshazzar, who are pleasure-seeking living for this life, and this life alone, whilst the enemy is at their gates. 
go across the streets of this city and further into the corners across the world, you will find people who are just like Belshazzar and are seeking sinful pleasure and sinful enjoyment. In Daniel chapter 5, one verse stands out to me because it reveals to me the reality of the human conscience. Daniel 5 verse 6 Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. Look at Daniel's vivid description that shows us that Belshazzar was truly terrified. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak. His carefree partying was so shallow that it turned from merry to terrified in a moment. I believe that his conscience knew that something was going to happen. I do believe that Belshazzar had a seared conscience, but even with his seared conscience, that conscience still had enough life in it to disturb him. He did not understand the writing after all, but yet the second the writing was on the wall, he was terrified. His conscience knew that something was going to happen. Even now as I am preaching, someone's conscience is knocking at their hearts, telling them to listen, telling them to get right with their Lord, their God. Just like Belshazzar, human beings have a false sense of security. We don't truly appreciate that we are fragile beings. You are a fragile, soft being. Do you understand how fragile and frail you truly are? Yes, you may have muscles and a six-pack and look like a Greek statue, but that really and truly changes nothing. You are a fragile being. You can be here one minute and gone literally the next minute. Belshazzar, with an army at his gate, he had a false sense of security. King Belshazzar should have been perfectly safe in that city. Its walls were said to be impenetrable and his city famously kept ten years of food provision at hand, so it could outlast any siege. He was so confident in his city's food provision, rather than rationing their food supply whilst on the siege, he held a feast. The brazen arrogance of Belshazzar, the complete disregard for the army at his doorstep, he had a false sense of security. And after all, he had Euphrates River passing directly through his city, giving it an endless water supply, which again could sustain it through any siege. All the water he needed. There again, he had a false sense of security. And that is the mindset of us human beings. We live with a false sense of security not knowing how truly fragile we are and how we can be here one second and literally the next second we can be standing before the Lord thy God. This false sense of security is what the devil wants people to live in, to think they have time and forget how life can change. We all need to shake ourselves out of this false sense of security that Belshazzar has. There was no safer place for Belshazzar to be than shut up in a city of Babylon, and yet history tells us this formidable fortress fell in one night. In one night, this fortress that no one could break into fell in one night. He thought it would last years under siege, but it didn't even last a single night. A false sense of security. A young man can live with a false sense of security and think, I can live in sin and I will get right with the Lord later in life. Are you sure? I have time. Are you sure? Are you absolutely certain? Or are you falling under the trap of a false sense of security? Young people die, old people die, rich people die, 
poor people die. Healthy people die. And unhealthy people die too. We don't know what tomorrow holds. I sometimes think of Belshazzar and what he must have been thinking ten minutes before he stepped from this side of eternity to the other side. I wonder what he thought about during those last ten minutes. Just ponder for a moment the thoughts that this king would have had during those last ten minutes. Maybe I should have prayed more. Maybe I should have honored God more. What exactly is on the other side of this life? I would not trust myself living another second without Jesus in my life. Jesus is who I need. Jesus is all I can hold on to. Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus loves you. Yes, he does. He loves you. Hold on to Jesus and he will hold on to you. Do you understand the love Jesus has for you? Do you understand that Jesus wants you in heaven more than you want yourself in heaven? God loves you. Yes, he does. You don't deserve it, but he loves you. Come to him. It is quite unfortunate that many believers do not even look beyond this world anymore. They are caught up with the events of this world to the extent that they have lost sight of heaven. So I encourage you today, do not lose sight of heaven. One thing that will humble you when you come to know the Lord is the brevity of life. It will humble you. The brevity of life will humble you. To see how quickly life moves will humble you. To see how quickly the years pass you by will humble you. To see the aging of your skin will humble you. To see the sagging of your flesh will humble you. To witness the wrinkles appear around your eyes will humble you. To witness the fragility of the human life will humble you. To witness the fragility of the human existence will humble you. To witness how someone can be here one moment and the very next moment they can leave this world will humble you. To witness the vulnerability of your loved ones and the realization that their presence is transient will humble you. To witness the unpredictability of life and the suddenness of unexpected events will humble you. Psalm 39 verses 4 to 5 Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath even those who seem secure. David's life was filled with extraordinary achievements. He was a champion, an accomplished warrior who defeated lions, bears, and even giants. He became a king, a leader of God's people. David's skills as a skilled poet and musical genius inspired songs to be sung about him. His survival through numerous trials further added to his notable reputation. Considering David's accomplishments, it would have been easy for him to think highly of himself. He had every reason to boast, as many others would have in his position. But David's true strength lay in his understanding of his own limitations and the transient nature of human existence. David recognized that, at our best state, we are but vapors. Like a fleeting puff of steam or smoke, our lives are here one moment and gone the next. This realization humbled David, reminding him that no matter how great our achievements, they are temporary. For David could see what others couldn't even imagine, he could see the temporary nature of life. Not knowing that we are all moments from either heaven or hell, I read a poem titled, Ten Minutes from Hell, and it went the following. In shadows deep, where darkness lies, a soul awakens, with fear in its eyes. Ten minutes from hell, the clock ticks fast, a moment's breath, before eternity's cast. Oh, the urgency that fills the air. Ten minutes remain, a soul's last prayer, a plea for mercy, a desperate cry, seeking redemption before the final goodbye. In those fleeting moments, hearts are stirred, realizing the truth of God's holy word. For in ten minutes, a life can change. When souls embrace salvation's range, the veil is thin, the boundary near. Ten minutes from hell, there's still time to steer toward the cross, where forgiveness flows, where grace abounds and mercy bestows. Oh, let not pride hold back your plea. 
in ten minutes from hell, choose to be free. Repent, surrender, let Jesus in, for his love can conquer every sin. So take heed, dear soul, don't delay. Embrace God's love, embrace his grace, and find eternal life in his embrace. For in the blink of an eye, it can all be done. Ten minutes from hell, eternity is one. So let this be the moment, the turning point in time, where heaven's gates open, and your soul finds its prime. John 14 verse 6 Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. But I have religion, I say. But if you do not have him, you are not going to go to the Father. But I am doing the best I can. But if you do not have Jesus, you will not make it to the Father. But I am a good person. But I pay my taxes. But I give to the poor. But I am a good citizen. But I don't break the law. My friend, if you do not have him, you cannot go to the Father. Without Christ, you are condemned already. Without Christ, heaven is not your home. Jesus Christ is everything to a believer, and not their own goodness, and not their own works. Jesus Christ is everything. He is the giver of life, and without him there is no eternal life. Think how miserable this life would be if it wasn't for Christ. For without Christ there would be no heaven, there would be nothing for us to look forward to. Think how miserable this life would be without Christ, waking up to go to work, come home, for three hours, with only weekends to look forward to, and repeating this for decades until you die. We would have only this world to enjoy, and really and truly what is there to enjoy in this world? Nothing lasts forever in this world. This world is full of darkness, despair, and desolation. Even the happiest of marriages still end in heartbreak. Two people who have been in a loving faithful relationship for decades, their marriage still ends in heartbreak when one of them dies, that's the world we live in. No happiness lasts forever in this world, but joy lasts forever if you have Christ. If the Lord Jesus Christ has not returned, you and I will have to go through the way that every human being has gone on this earth. Have you prepared for that? And the only way to prepare for your eternity is through knowing Christ. Do you understand you live in a real world? And just as this world you live in is a real world, hell is real, heaven is real, eternity is real, salvation is real, and judgment day is real, and it is coming. Judgment day is approaching. In the depths of our souls, we must come to terms with the brevity of life, a fragile existence that slips away like sand through an open palm. Our days on this earth are but a fleeting moment, a mere whisper in the vastness of eternity. Oh, how swiftly time passes, like a river rushing towards an inevitable destination. We must resist the allure of temporal pleasures and worldly distractions that surround us, for they veil the weightiness of our ultimate accountability. Let us not be deceived by the illusion of permanence, for every heartbeat brings us closer to the day when we shall stand before the Creator of all things. In the quiet corners of our hearts, we must confront the solemn truth that heaven and hell await. Heaven, a realm of eternal joy and peace, where the faithful find rest in the presence of the divine. Hell, a place of eternal separation from God's love and grace, where the consequences of our choices are eternally realized. The thought of such eternal destinies should give us pause, for they hold immeasurable significance. The brevity of our earthly lives should awaken us to the urgency of seeking truth, redemption, and reconciliation. It is in acknowledging the fleeting nature of our existence that we can grasp the eternal weight of our decisions. Let this knowledge guide our actions, shaping our priorities and igniting a passion for what truly matters. May we strive to live lives of righteousness, extending love and forgiveness to others, and preparing our souls for the day when our earthly journey concludes. As we ponder the swiftness of life's passing, let us be humbled by its transient nature. Like a morning mist that dissipates with the rising sun, our laughter and tears, our victories and defeats, fade into the tapestry of time. We must confront the reality that beyond the finite boundaries of this world, an eternal realm awaits. Let the solemnity of this truth seep deep into our souls, motivating us to align our lives with heavenly purpose. We cannot afford to be complacent, for the sands of time continue to slip away. In the face of life's brevity, we are called to seek forgiveness, to mend broken relationships, and to embrace the redemptive power of grace. The curtain of Judgment Day draws nearer with each passing moment, 
and we must be prepared to face the eternal outcome of our choices. Let us reflect upon our lives, relinquish our pride, and seek a genuine transformation of heart. The brevity of life should be a constant reminder of our need for divine mercy, and a catalyst for embracing a life that reflects the love and compassion of our Creator. In the face of life's brevity, we must confront the profound truth that our choices have eternal consequences. Each decision we make, whether big or small, carries weight in the grand scheme of our eternal destiny. The brevity of life serves as a stark reminder that we cannot afford to be careless or indifferent. We must be prepared, for the final outcome of our choices will shape our eternity. Consider the gravity of this realization. The choices we make in this fleeting life have far-reaching implications beyond our earthly existence. Our actions, words, and thoughts reverberate in the unseen realm, leaving an indelible mark on our souls. We are called to be wise stewards of the time we have been given, mindful of the eternal significance that accompanies our decisions. Therefore, let us be vigilant and mindful of the choices we make. Let us strive for righteousness and humility allowing God's grace to transform our hearts and guide our paths may we continually seek his wisdom and guidance, knowing that the eternal outcome of our choices hinges on our willingness to surrender to his perfect will. In this awareness, we find the motivation to live with intentionality, making choices that honor God and lead us closer to the eternal joys that await us. I read a poem titled, Ten Minutes from Hell, and it went the following, In shadows deep, where darkness lies. A soul awakens, with fear in its eyes. Ten minutes from hell, the clock ticks fast. A moment's breath, before eternity's cast. Oh, the urgency that fills the air. Ten minutes remain, a soul's last prayer. A plea for mercy, a desperate cry. Seeking redemption before the final goodbye. In those fleeting moments, hearts are stirred. Realizing the truth of God's holy word. For in ten minutes, a life can change. When souls embrace salvation's range, the veil is thin the boundary near. Ten minutes from hell, there's still time to steer, toward the cross, where forgiveness flows, where grace abounds and mercy bestows. Oh, let not pride hold back your plea. In ten minutes from hell, choose to be free. Repent, surrender, let Jesus in, for his love can conquer every sin. So take heed, dear soul, don't delay. Embrace God's love, embrace his grace, and find eternal life in his embrace. For in the blink of an eye, it can all be done. Ten minutes from hell, eternity is one. So let this be the moment, the turning point in time, where heaven's gates open and your soul finds its prime. I read a wonderful poem titled, Ten Minutes Before Heaven and it went the following, in the hush of the moment, as time slips away. Ten minutes before heaven, a glimpse of that day, the veil grows thin as eternity draws near. The presence of God, so tender and clear. In those fleeting minutes, our hearts are stirred. A taste of the glory that awaits undisturbed. We catch a glimpse of streets paved with gold. The beauty of heaven, a sight to behold. Ten minutes before heaven, our souls are aflame. With the promise of redemption, in Jesus' name. The weight of sin lifted, our hearts set free. To dwell in the presence of the Holy Trinity. No more pain or sorrow, no tears left to cry. Just unending love filling every sigh. In those precious moments, time stands still, as we glimpse the joy of God's perfect will. Ten minutes before heaven, a foretaste divine, the peace and serenity, like sweetest wine. We long for that day when we'll fully embrace the glory of heaven, God's eternal embrace. So let us live with purpose each passing day, knowing that heaven awaits just moments away. With hearts fixed on Jesus, our Savior and King, we'll rejoice forevermore in heavenly springs. Another thing you will experience in heaven is the feeling of being home. Because heaven is where your heavenly father dwells and you will finally, finally, finally be home. Where your heavenly father dwells. During your first hour in heaven, you will finally feel at home in complete and utter peace complete safety and security. Think about what it means to feel at home. It means being in a place where you are comfortable, where you are surrounded by people who love and care for you, where you can be yourself 
and feel accepted for who you are. That is exactly what heaven is. And that is exactly what you will experience during your first hour in heaven. You will be welcomed with open arms. You will be surrounded by the love of God and your fellow believers. And you will see the whole atmosphere of heaven will be the Holy Spirit. This reminds me of my favorite passage, John 14 verse 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We are not just wandering aimlessly in this world, trying to find our place or purpose. We have a destination, a place we belong, a place where we will be fully known and fully loved. This world hates believers. It hates the children of God. For the God of this world hates believers. But during your first hour in heaven, you will experience love like you have never experienced before. Because you will be home. You will be reunited with loved ones who have passed away in the Lord. If your parents have died in the Lord, you will see them again. You will be able to hug them again. You will be able to tell them you love them again. 